Well, hey everyone, my name is Nathan Jones, and if you're new here, welcome. I like to talk about all things movies, specifically Blu-rays, but today we're going to be talking about the 1950s. We're actually continuing with the 100 Years of Movies series. This time, I have my good friend, Chris Moen. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing all right, Nathan. Doing good. I, th- I thought for a while I've been invited on because maybe I was alive in the 1950s, but I have to break the bad news <laughs> and say, unfortunately not, but... <laughs> all right, we got to cut this. Um, apparently, <laughs> apparently, my... my uh, my my true intentions were were you know <laughs> thrown Indeed. out the door. but no it's good to see you buddy it's it's been a bit it has it has it has we've been chatting a bit on messenger here and there but it's it's always good to catch up uh, yeah and see exactly what you've been at you know yeah what I I mean I recently I know you've been looking at some French cinema on your channel mm. um how's that been that process been oh dear do you know when you think you love something and then you delve really into it and then it just becomes about 20 times worse uh, i could have done yeah. this 1950s thing just on french cinema as it turns out so i had to curtail myself a little bit especially because my channel i'm only trying to do one film per decade you know right. for, for that kind of season so i was like well i have, have another 20 that i could have done that year and this is just the opportunity to do it you know so uh but it, it's it's great fun it's it's nice to be able to look at a singular movie and kind of really think about it and kind of watch it stew on it for a while then come back and watch it again and then read whatever articles there are with it like it's yeah. real fun i feel like that's something that uh, I, both of us and uh, probably people who are watching this as collectors like we we are o- almost overwhelmed by the amount of things that we you know spend our time on and so mm-hmm. like savoring things like maybe looking at something like one at a time is something that a lot of us have to really train ourselves to yeah. to do, and so I think that's an excellent task, and I think that's uh, something that I think makes you appreciate things a little bit better. It definitely does. I mean, like I say, I've had an awful lot of fun with it, and uh, while it might be frustrating in terms of God, it's been six weeks since, since I did the last episode of that. It just means that I've more room to to think about it and and put something together, you know. So, well, well it's a great continue. series. It's a great series. I love it. So, thanks. And also the watch list too. I mean, you know, we have a similar, I think, type of video that we we both do of what like we're currently watching. And I always yeah. love watching, uh, kind of seeing where everyone's mindset is or where everyone's kind of uh, emotions are at the time. I suppose because you can see kind of what types of films we're all watching, right? Yeah, well, I mean, you set that many challenges at the moment, Nathan. You know, I can do a watch <laughs> list many. per challenge. You know, it's it's going pretty well with that. You know, <laughs> are you doing any of the challenges? Well, I just did. I did five world cinema there, and I'll do another five world cinema in a couple of weeks. I've done. I've got my ADE prepped for the record, so nice. I have my ADE done for that. So I know what films that I'm going to talk about for that, and then I haven't done a director one because I probably not do the director one because I like this. It's this kind of thing of you know the way a director who's dead, right, only has a finite number of movies, right, and I don't want to rest those all in one spot. They could go look at that rabbit hole of like watching two or three movies by somebody and going, these are just incredible. I just will probably talk about in some of these 1950s, you know, yeah, a lot of people had a lot of, of movies in this thing in this period, and you kind of go, right, I'll see if I can spread these out maybe a, a bit further down the line. But as what we're talking about, you often watch movies and then forget you watch them. Um, <laughs> before as, we, yeah, tell, as your memory just starts to go, maybe that gets worse as you get older. And maybe we'll see. <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about the 50s and we have to think that that far back, right? Uh, <laughs> Um, but yes, our, our memory, uh, just the, the amount of things that we all watch, it's, it's kind of insane because I'm sure that, I mean, I'm sure you had this problem when we were kind of, uh, coming up with both of our, our lists, um, that probably some of these films we haven't seen in probably a long time, but it's at the same, at the same time, like we still have good memories. We can still talk about them. Um, and we can still bring them up, but it is interesting. Like we have to, those are, these are some of our favorites, obviously. And so with that, you know, we have good memories associated with them or they've mm-hmm. challenged us in a certain way. Uh, but you know, there's a, a plethora of other movies we could have been, we could have chose and they're in their place that we probably have seen, but just either A, they don't mean as much to us or B, like we, we've seen them, but like we don't remember terribly too the, much about it. Yeah. Yeah, I often think uh, whenever you, you look at a movie in your shelf and you look at it, it's like the emotion or the there's like a resonance of, a, of an emotion that, that you attach to that movie. Uh, and you can't really describe what it is about the movie, you know, because plot details, characters, all that kind of stuff kind of mush into one. But you just have that feeling of I'm drawn with the warmth for that movie, you know, for whatever reason it was. And then it makes it into the pile. Yeah. I hope that uh, all the cho- all our choices are actually like warm, right? So obviously <laughs> there are some there are some, some some choices I'm sure that you know as obviously all of us are 
our fan of like the avant-garde or maybe the art house cinema that maybe aren't as warm <laughs> to us or rewatchable. Um, and some of those are our favorite films. Like, you know, for instance, like I would say Metropolis is a, a film mm. prime example of from the twenties that like, that is not a, that is a cold film. And, and it's not, it has some heart obviously to it. There's some, you know, triumph in it, but at the end of the day, it's like, it's still like, it's, it's a, it's a chore to watch it, but at the same time, it's also, um, it's, it's good to, uh, it's good to watch it. It's say. good to watch. There's a brilliance to it that's very evident from the moment that the, the film starts. That right. it's kind of like unlike nearly anything that has even been made in the next hundred years. You know, right? It's just, uh, it's just yeah. Cool. It's just there's, there's 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 all there's all reasons why we watch these movies. So yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. But uh, what I was thinking, actually, I don't think I talked about this uh, beforehand. Uh, but I, what I was thinking was actually just uh, we were gonna. So what? Um, the audience i'm talking to you now uh what we normally do in this uh in this series is we talk about um, our favorite or the decade in general uh at first just kind of kind of get an idea of like what was going on at the time period uh in the world um and then also at the same time choosing five films that we uh think are like maybe our favorites of the decade they don't have to be in any particular order um, and some of them might just be films that maybe aren't as uh, looked at as much um, but some of them I really, I'm very flexible with uh, what our, our films that we want to talk about, but also we're going to, I think, uh, interlace some honorable mentions alongside the five uh, films that we choose. Um, I actually kind of have them thematically for me um, right here. And so like, you know, if I'm going to talk about one movie, like maybe a Japanese film, I'll bring up a few other Japanese films that mm-hmm. I'll be like, uh, like, you know, I didn't choose these films. Like I, I love both these films or vice versa and then but like I'm, i choose this one so something along those lines yeah. so that, that works for me yeah um so uh i'm gonna go ahead and let chris uh, give us either his some honorable mentions or if he wants to start off with his first film uh, uh let's uh, go, go for ahead. honorable mentions because these are yeah. all very good films in my, in my in my view um let's go for since you're got you're gonna group thematically i'll go and grab my uh my two from japan to start off with um and maybe no surprise as to who the directors of the two are uh, that are here so one's by ozu and i'm gonna pick good morning if that oh my blurred background's gonna mess with this is it you might oh there we there go we. there we go i'll do that so good morning this is the bfi release of, of good morning uh, the film which is about fart jokes maybe more so than anything else <laughs> you know jokes, yeah it has some fight, fart jokes in it but i think mainly it's it's about uh, a very childlike look and view of the world, the things that are important to people. There's the lovely criterion, criterion version, right the, two, the two boys um, who basically just want a TV. Yeah. And they, uh, they by hook or by crook, they take on a uh, silence and they're so committed to it that it doesn't just extend to being in the house, it's to school and everything and gets them mm-hmm. into trouble. And like a lot of Ozzy stuff, it's just this complete charm fest for the, the entire runtime from start to finish as you kind of you kind of think the two boys are very silly and very stupid, but at the same stage, you kind of root you for them a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> you understand why that, why they want this TV. And I love the, the older brother just more or less roping in the younger brother. And he f- sometimes forgets that he's like almost speaks and he's like, no, we're not, we're not speaking. No, we're not doing it's it's, it's, that, it's that look of approval from younger brother to big brother. Mm-hmm. Can, can I speak now? No. Okay. Okay. And that's, uh, you know, this is part of the, part of the club. And uh, the other uh, Japanese one, I mean, Kurosawa uh, could you could have picked like anything from from the decade. I'm gonna go for Ikaru and uh, the story of the, the guy that works in the council office uh, doing a humdrum day to day job who finds out that he's um, he's got a limited time left in the world pretty much and uh, how it changes his perception about what way he looks at life and the things that he should be doing. What's a good time to a good thing to spend his time on, etc. And that adjustment from the humdrum of existing to living. And uh, yeah. kind of done beautifully. Like there's a many uh, many uh, a damp cheek after watching Ikaru. Yeah, I was gonna say you just brought two very warm films here, um, <laughs> and, and different and different and different in different aspects. ways. Yeah, different ways. Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, it's almost like you got a uh, a film about youth and a film about death. That's, in, that's in, true. In, in a weird <laughs> that was a weird cycle, but like both of those films are excellent. Uh, I haven't seen. Ikaru, I think I saw it last year or the year before for the first time, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, like you said, not no dry treat, no dry, no nah, cannot talk dry cheek at all mm-hmm. because it is just um, it's almost like um, I guess 
akin to something along the lines of if anyone's anyone's not seen this and if anyone's a fan of it's a wonderful life mm. it's it's got i mean it's different it's very different but uh it can have it's, some things it's got the are, snow at the end as well it films. does have some snow at the end mm-hmm. so but it's it's an excellent film and i i would highly recommend both of those films and i think they're on the criterion channel i think both they both are too. indeed yeah yeah, yeah. but it, you're in the uk uh you know uh i would say bfi um or you know uh right yeah bfi and i could re- I, th- I think it's in bfi as well they do the non summer summary collection as well but uh that uh, that criterion release is amazing as well it has a document for long documentary on it as well which is which is excellent that's lucky i mean we can't get bfi here i don't think uh no doesn't although even i do think uh, the uh, on good morning i think the because Good Morning was a remake of an earlier film, and I think the earlier film is on the Criterion release as well. I was born, but yeah, it is. It is the uh, it is, uh, so it's common to both releases. So um, I think that's really worth watching as well. It's from 1939, yeah. but yeah, yeah. If you're in the states, or uh, you can order as Criterion here. If you're in Ireland or the UK, it's you know you can get it's uh, in the BFI. So yeah, yep. yep. So uh, those are excellent, excellent choices there. I will we'll move to Japan in. A, I guess, well, might as well. I don't, you know, there's no, there's no order. I'll, I'll move to Japan too. You know, why not? Um, so uh, I have two films, uh, both actually by the same director. Um, and we already uh, talked about Kurosawa a little bit. And so might as well bring up, this is, I feel like this is the, this is the decade that Kurosawa really come, came on his own and like really come to be the director that he would obviously. But um, I actually have this poster in my kitchen. Um, I don't have, this is, uh, this is my honorable mention, um, but I will say that Rashomon from 1950 is certainly one of the best films of all time. Um, it's one of my favorite films. Um, it's uh, it's a tale. Uh, is it four ways? They, there's four different uh, Indeed, ways yeah. that people kind of see this same event, this this rape and murder that happens, and uh, you know, it's just it's like the trial, and the trial is like kind of recounting those events and like really what happened and. It really is looking at like maybe that bystander effect mixed in with um, like a lot of the psychological things that were going on I, I, in the, you know, the 1940s and 50s kind of that, you know, would start blossoming uh, a little bit more so in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s really take over because a lot of um, a lot of these psychological theories were really popular at the time. And so this was just like putting this into uh, a, a medieval feudal Japan uh, mixed in with a lot of, uh, you know, things that society has to deal with and really dealing with a morality tale and figuring it out, uh, the details with that. Because it is, it, for 1950, this is uh, quite a uh, quite a film to watch, um, especially thinking about the society at the time, because this is post-war Japan, you know, and not, it's, it's five years after, after uh, you know, Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki. So it's, this, you know, is, I, I have a sneaking suspicion that, uh, a lot of Japanese directors maybe, you know, made films to escape, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and to um, kind of, you know, get a footing back into the culture of, you know, what it meant to be Japanese. And I, I feel like um, those are some things that aren't really played out so much in this per se, but it really does um, kind of, I feel like, you know, play a little bit of a role in, in film like this. So the films of the time. Yeah, I, th- I think Rashomon's pretty symptomatic, actually, of, of the change that happened in the 50s, where, you know, films went from having to be entertaining to being entertaining, but actually the art house cinema kind of thing was coming through that did some philosophical themes that they wanted to bring and talk about. And those were the things that were, you know, starting to evolve and starting to happen much more in mainline cinema, uh, certainly in Japan with Kurosawa at the time, because, you know, a lot of the deeper seated themes that run through a lot of his movies are... are, are are there all the time, but maybe, you know, the entertainment part of the other runtime is what, you know, had to be extended to include that kind of stuff as, uh, as happening, right. you know? Yeah. And actually, I think this actually is a, is a natural transition to actually my first pick, if I might as well just say yeah. it since it is. Um, and this one should be obvious for a lot of people. If I didn't choose, you know, Ikaru or Rashomon uh, as my choice, I would obviously choose Seven Samurai, which is, um, you know, arguably one of the best films of all time. Um, and like, it's probably objectively better than Rashomon, but uh, I struggle between the two as some of my favorites. And I also love Ran in the 1980s, mm-hmm. but, um, but anyway, 
this film, I mean, I don't have to say much about it because I feel like most of the people who are watching this have seen this film. This is actually the first movie that I ever had in the Criterion Collection for, for my, you know, for my purchase. Um, and rightfully so, it's number two in the collection, yeah. um, which um, is amazing. But this is a, an amazing tale, uh, obviously about seven samurai. And uh, they are tasked, they're all ronin and they're all masterless and they're all more or less kind of one by one tasked to protect this village who are attacked by bandits. It's a very simple tale uh, of just, you know, protecting the, the meek and uh, really just trying to um, look out uh, for somebody who can't really defend themselves, but also at the same time, uh, you got a, a bunch of different characters in this film, obviously um, with the villagers themselves, the bandits, and even the seven samurai, they all have different, different personalities and uh, they're all fleshed out very, very well. This is a very long film too. It's 200 and a half hours, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost four hours, um, 207 minutes. Um, but the runtime doesn't really feel no. like warrant. Like it, you don't feel that. Um, I actually just recently last early last year or the year before watched this actually at a, at Alamo draft house in a, the cinema. And it was an incredible experience. And I was just really blown away. Cause I mean, this is, you know, one of those films that uh, transformed, not just, you know, I guess, uh, Japanese films, but also in the West too, because, um, you know, this has a lot of stuff that like maybe that like Kurosawa took from John Ford, um, mm -hmm. obviously. And, uh, later on, uh, George Lucas and Steven and Steven Spielberg would take things, you know, from a, an epic like this, um, as just an example. Um, but obviously that's, it's pretty well known that the, the Western and the, and I guess the, the, the samurai films really kind of go hand in hand a little bit and there's some influence and also there's some criticism too um, from the Japanese themselves uh, uh, with you know these types of films that Kurosawa put out that almost like mimicked a western um, and we're a little bit Americanized I suppose but yeah. at the same time these are you know these are uniquely Japanese you know stories and um, that's what's so great about the 50s and 60s I feel like Japanese cinema you you would see a lot of different like uh, Mizuguchi um, you know, Ozu, uh, they would all, they all tackle different things. And yeah. I think that's really, really, um, telling of the, of the, um, you know, of the society at the time. And I think Seven Samurai is a perfect, perfect amalgam of, you know, like taking something so simple, but also making it so complex and rich and really diving and in, in delving into like the human condition. And I think it's, I think it's an excellent film and, uh, it'll, it'll literally run you the gamut of emotions. So this is my first pick. Oh, that's a fantastic film, and uh, the 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 legend of Toshiro Mifune in that mm, in that Toshiro. film of being the, the character that is a coochie, or is it is that how you say it? Oh, uh, but he's the character that for maybe the first part of the film he's he's the annoyance. Yeah, he's and just, uh, he's you know, the, kid of the, the group. The longer runtime kind of makes the hero out of him, you know, which is just uh, that 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 circle of uh, of his characters is just amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I didn't even talk about how excellent all the performances were, but I mean, oh, I, just everyone in it, obviously Mifune, you know, stealing the show with you know, with you know his his character who um, just you know, like you said, just kind of takes a, a one eighty and really becomes becomes the biggest hero of them all. Yeah. But um, really, it is about sacrifice and you know taking an care honor, of, you know, an honor, yeah, much, you know that kind of. That kind of thing. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. excellent choice. So, not much to follow up. Just what have I got in response to Seven Samurai? <laughs> oh yes, your turn now. <laughs> right. So we'll go for France then. <laughs> All right, France. I'm going to go Here for my, go. my bit. Uh, I'll do my honorable mentions for France. Um, I'll talk about uh, Jacques Becker first. Uh, Cast Door. I'm not sure if this has been released there at all. This is Studio Canal version from here. I'm not aware uh, of it Castor, either. Door, well, Simone Signore is somebody that many people will uh, recognize. Um, but it tells a story of a a small village where the mob, kind of the French mob, run it. So there's people that are rich and are abusing their power throughout money making schemes. As uh, Simone Signore's character is very much attached to one of the mob members. The boss takes an interest in her, but she also kind of falls for the new guy in town. He's a reformed criminal who's trying to play it straight. 
and uh, you get this kind of cacophony of, of things that could happen. And I often say the best thing about a lot of these French films are is they weren't impacted by the code. So, you know, you don't necessarily always know what way this is going to go. Sometimes it goes the way that you would expect. Sometimes it does not. And uh, I think that's always a lot of the fun of these films around that period because they were dealing with an awful lot of the same things that were happening in Hollywood movies. Mm -hmm. But they were an awful lot more open-ended as, as to how they would resolve, etc. So there's that one. And then I've got French Cancan by Jean Renoir. Ah, uh, Renoir, yeah. Uh, so this one, and actually the next, the uh, my actual pick for France, uh, I both came to from a recommendation from our mutual friend, Elliot, Elliot Cohen. Uh, he had recommended both of these BFI releases and uh, picked them up both at the same time. And French Cancan is the story of a restaurant that was a Cancan bar. Jean Gabin runs the the bar uh, and basically exploits an awful lot of these young women and his relationships to his own end. It's just brilliant. Very colourful, beautiful movie, French Can, can uh, and hardly recommend it. But my actual pick is uh, a Max Ophel's. Oh, excellent. A film. Um, and it is The Earnings of Madame De, or Madame De, as it's sometimes called. Have you seen it? I have not. You have not. So I've only seen two Renoir films. Oh, well, this one's Max Ophel's. Oh, so sorry, sorry, Max. This yeah, one's Max sorry. Ophel's indeed. So yeah, yeah, just... uh, an old romantic would be Max Ophel's. Uh, and it very loosely tells the story of a pair of earrings. It starts off with the Countess needing some money, selling them to jeweler, but promising not to tell her husband because she needed the money and they were a wedding present bought from her. And these earrings go on a, a journey around the world that maybe comes back into their life, maybe does not. And... Um, it's about the journey of the earrings, but it's also about the people that it passes through and how it comes back. Because the Countess and the, the General, the Count, uh, are what look to be happily married. But if you dig underneath the surface, it's very much, or it's very apparent that she's very much a thing to him. You know, she's somebody nice to hang off his arm. He isn't really that fussed. But there are other people in the aristocracy at that time who she does fall for. And it's very much that... What would be a classic Hollywood or, or period piece where that on that forbidden love kind of things kind of swept out the feet, but they don't do anything about it. And it's just everything's just kind of caught up in this lovely swirl of how it's filmed. They dance together. Uh, the, the other actor is actually played by Victoria Victoria De Sica, who is obviously the director of Bicycle Thieves and Umberto D, etc., which are also in the collection. But uh, it's just an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous movie, uh, which I often find weird because my wife would watch a lot of period TV specifically. And I forever teasing her that they have the same plot all the time. They're about exactly the same things. You, you watch one and you watch them all. Uh -huh. And I would never watch one with her. But if you make that movie in J J Japanese <clears throat> or French, I'm all in. <laughs> 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 I forgive all of those things if, if it's just, if I can put it under the umbrella of foreign cinema. Yeah, if cinema. you just, you're like, well, if you just export it out of where I live, <laughs> and then maybe I can handle this. <laughs> so it, it's definitely that movie. And it, it, it's, again, it, it's just in, incredible, incredible piece of filmmaking. And uh, yeah, I even watched rewatch it last night just to, just to be sure. Uh, I thought I'd stick it on for a while, just remind myself what happened in it, and then of course I watched the whole thing again because it's just, it's 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 wonderful. And uh, as somebody says in one of the extras of it too, it says like it's almost the perfect movie about a woman because on the outset she looks like she's flighty and flirty and all that kind of stuff, but actually she's sort of the result of abuse, as you see throughout the film, etc., and uh, how she's actually put upon. In, in the entire film. So that's the earnings of Madame De. I'll have to check it out. And I, I, yeah, I need to watch more um, Max uh, Ophels. Is that how you say Ophels, yep, yep, indeed. Yep. And uh, also Renoir films. Actually, a yeah. Renoir film. Uh, so this is a little preview for everybody. If you, But for Criterion, actually, I have uh, uh, The River coming my way. Um, that's uh, a little bit uh, of a Renoir film. I know it's one of those later films, but... It is. It's coming looking... out in BFI next month as well. They've oh, done a re-release and a new scan of it as well. So I'm looking forward to that as well. I've never seen it to begin with, but I, I'm yep. looking forward to it. So uh, I don't good. have any French films, unfortunately. Did I got you covered? <laughs> but but I appreciate you, you covering me. A lot of my my French knowledge is weirdly in the 40s and 60s, uh, which I would say a lot of people's uh, probably are, uh, mm -hmm. at least who watch this. But yes, um, actually, uh, speaking of code, 
uh, like the, you know, the Hays Code. I was going to talk about uh, a film. This is just an honorable mention here, um, but I know we were both going to probably talk about it. And actually, uh, I have a coffee right here. So this is uh, aptly the big heat mm. right here. So if you know anything about coffee and the big heat, um, this is actually one of my favorite uh, noir films. And it's actually kind of made near the end of the noir uh, era. Sure. Um, and it's Fritz Lang too. So it's one of his last films uh, as well. I want to say, right? It's one of his last ones. Uh, mm. Did he, did he was his last film in the 60s? His last film is in the 60s, yeah. And he also okay. starred in, um, isn't it Contempt? Isn't it the, right. uh, the good, good art film? Right. Well, it, it's one of his later films. Well, yeah. We'll just say that. Uh, but The Big Heat, um, excellent, excellent uh, film with Glenn Ford uh, and Gloria Graham, uh, especially in this film. Uh, Jocelyn, Brand Jocelyn Brando is in this as well. Um, this is just an excellent, excellent, uh, and also very vicious film, um, for especially for a noir. Like, you, you know, you obviously, if, if you've seen a noir, you've seen probably most noirs. Um, uh, if you've seen one, uh, but this one is definitely unique uh, in its execution. And also th if you're thinking about, you know, like we were talking about the, the code, it, this almost was pushing it. So honestly, this was kind of near the end of the code era uh, and things were kind of just transitioning out uh, in the fifties, even though I guess in America, the fifties were a very conservative time period uh, just in the culture in general, because we were just coming out of world war II um, coming into the Cold War and kind of getting that paranoia starting or rolling up. And I'm sure if we're talking about maybe a little bit later, maybe a sci-fi or horror-based things, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about the Cold War. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, Big Heat uh, is an excellent film, and I would highly recommend. This is the um, indicator release, so this is a, a Region B. Actually, it's all regions, um, but uh, so if you wanted to order it, this is the way to do it because I think the Twilight Time is actually out of print. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah you've seen the big heat i have indeed it's an absolutely amazing film and glory graham for me is the entire star of that whole era as far as female performances go i just think she's absolutely dynamite every time she's on screen and particularly so in 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 this as well and it's funny the, the point you make about it coming out is nearly not code-esque well, I was, did, did a podcast recently uh, and we were talking about how a lot of the great directors around that time subverted the code and got all mm -hmm. of the drama ahead of the ending. So got nearly made it so the ending was irrelevant in some ways. Mm -hmm. All of the action was before that. So Nicholas Ray would have done it in his films as well. You know, had the drama and the setup and the premise and the danger happen there and then not have to worry about the end. So yeah, really, really interesting. That is interesting how they got, they got around it is... So it's always interesting to kind of see how directors, I guess, early on, especially, uh, and maybe like some of the, the sex comedies and, and, and things like that kind of play play around with it in the script and then uh, the innuendos. But um, with like the noirs, it's, it's interesting to where like where you'd put the, the action and where you'd put the, you know, the motifs, I suppose. So it's excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I'm. Yeah, I didn't think about that before. But uh, Yeah, I, I, I can only imagine how shocking the coffee scene was at the time. Uh, if you had been sitting in the cinema, you know, I can imagine that would have been, oh my God, taking <laughs> one of the most beautiful women on the planet at that time and kind of yep, subjected her to, to that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. But uh, speaking of noirs and how it would trans, I feel like it would transition. Um, I, I'm sure people probably want to see us talk about this uh, this filmmaker. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, I will just mention, this is an honorable mention here, but I will talk about Hitchcock right here. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, you know, this is, this would be like maybe the, the era that Hitchcock really kind of took off. Um, and then, you know, he'd make his, uh, a lot of his greater films in the late fifties and early sixties, I suppose is the ones that he is known for. But one of his earlier films actually in this collection that I actually quite enjoy with Jimmy Stewart is right here from 54 rear window right here mm. it's a very voyeuristic film uh the whole point uh, is you know this weird um you know neighborhood uh that you're in this apartment building and uh you know you uh, have a pair of binoculars and you're just kind of looking at your neighbors it's like people watching what you do uh what you do in at least in the states there's uh, we have walmart here and there's <laughs> you can do something similar to that but uh not with not as creepy with binoculars but um, you know, something happens uh, in this story, uh, as a Hitchcock story would. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, it's like, oh, well, we had to figure out who, who it is and, and like how they did it and 
Um, but like there's a, obviously this paranoia that's just kicking in uh, the whole entire time. But uh, Rear Window, it's been a while since I've seen it, but I definitely mm -hmm. wanted to mention it because um, this is definitely one of my favorite Hitchcock films of, of the run that he did. Um, mm -hmm. You've seen Rope, or, uh, <laughs> Rear Window, right? I've seen Rear Window, but as I was saying to you before we started <laughs> there, I have this problem with Hitchcock movies in that they all blend into one when you haven't seen them for a while. And uh, yeah. But Rear Window, the premise, I remember the premise uh, without necessarily remembering remembering what happened at the end which always makes it good for a rewatch re because uh right it's uh like going back through but yeah things like the, the catch a thief and, and stuff came at that time as well which i, I do quite enjoy even if it's it kind of goes off the the reels i think towards the second second half of it etc but uh yeah good fun to see grace kelly on screen yeah uh, it's always fun to see see her on there and uh and carrie grant's always incredibly watchable yeah um so uh what direction do you want to go next is so it? I'm going to go, I have one title here that isn't like anything else that I have. So I'm just going to pull it out because 1950s, obviously, uh, there was the <clears throat> B movie period That's that happened along there. So if if that gives you an idea, I'm going to go with the most famous or maybe the biggest budget oh, of the B wow. movies, which is Forbidden Planet. Excellent. Uh, and it's a bit of a cheat to pick this because it wasn't really like many of those other films that were in that time because it did have a lot of budget. The... Uh, MGM, I think, was through a lot of money behind Forbidden Planet, uh, and it tells because it, I still think Forbidden Planet looks incredible as a as a film and how it stacks up. The story of uh, Leslie Nielsen coming to save a father and daughter off a planet and uh, getting to a world <laughs> where you know obviously strange things are happening. There's the there's a supposed monster, uh, a Disney monster, as it turns out. <laughs> A Disney animation monster, yeah, uh, and, and and a robot that kind of foreshadows a Terminator or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, ter yeah, Terminator and Hal yeah. from two thousand one, probably. Indeed, yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> Robbie the robot, awesome, but it's just a really inventive and clever, clever film. It wasn't, it wasn't one note like an awful lot of B movie. Uh, Fair was around that time of being just you know, there's a monster, we have to get away from the monster or kill the monster. This was way more nuanced than that. And uh, yeah, just fantastic. Yeah, and also Leslie Nielsen is not playing his normal what what we would see Leslie Nielsen become later on, uh, and like the Naked Gun and and That's right. a lot of the you know uh, the movies that he would be in uh, from th that point on, where he was just very slapstick. He was always playing himself. That's the funny thing, is or like at least his delivery was still you know intact. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it's interesting to see a young Leslie Nielsen in the sci-fi film and like it's it's so excellent and if you're you know about his like future works from that from that point on it's like a little bizarre seeing him <laughs> in a role like that it's funny because you kept on i kept on waiting for him to break into that character mm -hmm. you know and even if he had a still think it kind of would have worked <laughs> right of course yeah it's just, <laughs> you know it's because of the nature is. of the film etc you know so <clears throat> uh yeah i think his presence and, and again knowledge of his future work only plays into what makes it even more interesting you know Right. Well, that's an excellent pick. Um, and actually, uh, if we're going to go with sci-fi, uh, we'll talk about another film uh, directed by Howard Hawks, which was a precursor to uh, a lot of films uh, like John Carpenter did in the in the future. Mm -hmm. But The Thing from Another World right here on Warner Archive, mm -hmm. um, this is an incredible film, uh, very different from The Thing. Um, obviously, this is uh, all uh, based on who goes there which is like a i guess a novella is that what was that what you'd call it it's like a short story i think it was like an awful lot of those short story novellas that was how yeah. they got published um right. in, in newspapers and magazines etc but yeah so it's based on who goes there um which uh, later on john carpenter uh would uh, make in the 80s which we'll probably talk about later because that's one of my favorite movies of all time um a little hint there um but this is a really fun film uh and uh i think it's it's a really great film about like trust and like isolation uh, mixed in with uh, a really brilliant cast and crew. Um, but then they have, you know, this big, big supernatural uh, kind of element kind of kick in, uh, you know, out of from outer space, um, which, you know, this goes back to talking about the Cold War. So, <clears throat> you know, the space race was, you know, just starting to kick off, I think, I feel like around this time period. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of uh, our paranoia around the world um was definitely um you know prevalent in a lot of the sci-fi films that we would see in this time like them or the thing from another world or even like you know forbidden planet and so thinking about the you know those concepts it's very interesting to kind of see like uh, all that paranoia kind of just put into like this this 
this fantasy, this fiction, this science fiction kind of element and, and see um, where like people's imagination would go. Like, we're like, like how crazy would it have been if the things that, you know, in forbidden planet or the thing from another world actually would happen. And these were, I feel like real, I mean, obviously these are movies, but this isn't too far away from like War of the Worlds, you know, the H.G. Wells, yeah. which we didn't talk about either. Um, but if you remember like the the, the radio uh, adaptation that Orson Welles read, like that actually scared people like yeah, yeah. legit because they didn't know that they, they were actually getting invaded. So Well, the, the threat was science. You know what I mean? The threat was of a nuclear bomb. So it was science that was the thing that people were actually afraid of. So right. whether it was a nuclear explosion or aliens from another planet even more advanced scientific technology or mm -hmm. take over your brain or take you over as a person like really uh that, that's where all those fears were manifested in you know and made for great escapism because those those films are pretty great to watch yeah they're a lot of fun and you know if you're watching this and like you have um kids and stuff i would definitely recommend like watching these with them and like even though some of them kind of could, could, could be a little bit more talky uh, mm -hmm. then, you know, less, less of the action because the budgets aren't like the biggest thing in the world. Um, I, you know, they are still a lot of fun because like I, we'll talk a little bit later about some films um, uh, that are maybe a little bit more apt to that imagination mm -hmm. that we, we can talk about. But I did want to bring these up um, just because I don't know if you were going to bring them up or at all, but this was the, the, the era of, of Hammer and mm -hmm. Hammer films was starting to become a really big thing. Uh, they started taking off. They actually have some sci-fi films like X the Unknown, right? Um, right. Uh, and and these these tales that like you know would really kind of put them on the map. But then they kind of went the horror direction, right? And I did want to mention both, you know, the Dracula and Frankenstein series, like the starts of of them. And uh, these are on Warner Archive here in the states, mm -hmm. but these are excellent, excellent films. Um, <clears throat> and I would definitely recommend them. I mean, if you're a fan of Obviously, Christopher Lee or Peter Cushing, you know, these are like, you know, two excellent, excellent films uh, that they're they're both in, uh, kind of playing the opposites of each other, right? So one's a hero, one's a villain, one's a hero, one's a villain, uh, and both are great in both of those roles, like, mm -hmm. as, you know, the villain, I love Peter Cushing in this, um, and, I mean, uh, Christopher Lee's not really the hero, um, but him as the, as the, the creature, Frankenstein's monster, um, this is uh, iconic, and this is the first time you'd see it in color, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Everyone was was so used to the Boris Karloff, you know, um, Frankenstein, and then in here, it's like this is the first time you'd see really like Dracula getting taken seriously again because he kind of got spoofed away. And both of these, you know, the Abbott and Costello films, right? Everyone in the Universal was kind of pushing them to be like it's silly now, right? But Hammer put it back uh, on the like, oh, it actually is, it can be scary, but also like inventive and and colorful too. The the colors in the, these movies, I'm sure I, I can go on, but I know you know more about hammer as well well it, it's it's that thing of uh <clears throat> creating really proper escapism cinema you know for, for people to go that was meaty that wasn't just uh for for jokes or for laughs it was for you know you there's something in this that will either scare you or titillate you you know in either way and uh yeah i mean the fact that they they started there and they made a lot more of those movies over a very long extended period of time it tells you all about how good and watchable those films were at right. the time you know yeah and uh, I, I know people who watch my channel know how much i'm i'm on hammer right now so yeah. i want to talk that one to death but oh the 60s are going to be oh, going to be great fun <laughs> I'm, yeah i know I'm, I'm excited about that i i finally have them all on blu-ray the ones that are available on blu-ray so i'm i'm going to dive into those once i dive into these these box sets behind me i have a few more left uh from indicator that i'm i'm going to do um but I, I haven't even talked about my second choice yet, and I just wanted to bring it up real quick because um, no, I feel like it's thematically connected to this. It's horror, but it, not really in a typical way. Uh, and it's the only film ever directed by Charles Lofton. Um, and this is, this is one of my favorite movies ever. And it's mm. literally one of the scariest movies I've ever seen. Uh, and this is Night of the Hunter right here. With Robin Misham, uh, Shelley Winters, um, Lillian Gish, like it's just ah, it's I don't it's, really know how to to talk about this movie uh, without like just getting a little chill on, on my spine. Um, it's just uh, at, it's just like perfect atmosphere, uh, eeriness to it. Um, it's almost got this um, supernatural elements 
to it, uh, just in uh, the way things play out in this film. Uh, and honestly, it's it's got incredible performances by both the children, uh, obviously Robert Mitchum, uh, who is unforgettable in this, and a late silent star in Lillian Gish, who is just excellent in this as well. Um, but yeah, you've seen Night of the Hunter, right? Oh, I do. The, the thing that always strikes me about Night of the Hunter is that it's there's a menace to it. It's not. I wouldn't say it, it, this, the horror comes from the menace of Rob Mitchum's character. He's almost like a Superman character, the man who can't stop coming after you. Doesn't matter what you do to get away from him or where you think you're hiding, he's going to find you. And if he finds you, bad things are going to happen. And that's the bit that always strikes me about Night of the Hunter. You know, you can look at the, the, how beautiful the film is. You know for such a menacing film you know it's just beautifully shot and made and another one of those films that people didn't like at the time you know it's just kind of so many of the films that have become favorites in, in all of the years since just were not appreciated at the time we talked before recording and metropolis um was not appreciated at the time which seems absolutely bizarre right think, think, thinking about it and same night of the hunter like how that man only made one movie because of the reception and his experience of doing this uh, is, is is such a shame because you can only think what could have happened um makes that all more special forward. for this particular release because it i mean obviously we can see his acting career and he's excellent in so many films right um obviously um but you know this this film in particular where he, you know, tried his hand at, at uh, directing. Uh, I think he did a really excellent job here. And uh, even though he didn't live to see it, because he just, yeah. he passed away not too long after he made this, right? Yeah. Yeah. But so. uh, just a, a phenomenal <clears throat> movie. Definitely like a cornerstone one to watch. Even, even, see, the thing I would say about being medicine, my, my wife will, anything that's remotely scary, she will not watch. Uh-huh. <clears throat> But this, it's not really scary in that sense. And, and obviously she, she watched it and thought it was terrific. So, you know, it maybe doesn't sit on the scary, scary, overtly scary side right. rather than, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a hard it's a hard movie to categorize, really. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, but I definitely, like, I mean, obviously right now in the States, there's the Barnes & Noble sale. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that Amazon is uh, price matching a lot of that too, but... Yeah, if you're looking, I, I, the Criterion titles that I've mentioned, uh, this is uh, certainly uh, one of the the ones that are like you need to watch this movie mm -hmm. and you need to own it because it's just it's just immaculate. So, um, but what about uh, you, Chris? So my next, hmm, my next one. Uh, these were just two honorable mentions because they're really from one of my favorite uh, directors yeah. from the whole fifties. That's Ali Kazan. Uh, one of the people that I would consider to be one of the best people at getting great performances out of people and categorized very well by these two films. So one's obviously on the waterfront with, uh, with Martin Brando, Hello. which is just in just phenomenally good. Good film. There you go. Snap. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, uh, th this release specifically is something else. The documentary on the Kazan's life and how he was shunned, et cetera, around that time for his members of the Communist Party is nearly as good as the film itself, I have to say. Uh, but uh, yeah, on the waterfront, the, the story of Martin Brando's character who's working for what is essentially the mob in, in a city, but kind of wanting better for himself, you know, but being basically the thug for, for, for that group because he wasn't seen as smart enough or capable enough for otherwise than that. And uh, that's what on the waterfront. And then coupled with that is another great performance uh, in Face, Face in the Crowd. Still haven't seen um, it. I want to so bad. Oh god, so, I good. Know. so Andy Griffith in it is basically. I mean, you could just say it's an allegory to modern day social media. Somebody blows up on social media, becomes so big that they kind of get offered all these roles and all this acclaim, and they kind of lose a run of who they are as a person. They become the caricature that, that people like, uh, and that's pretty much what facing the crowd is like. It says success uh, rises and rises, and uh, it's it's just. It's facing the crowd is an awful lot of fun. It's an awful lot of uh, good in it, but there's also a lot of heartbreak in it as well as you kind of see um, the human element of, of all of that side of fame and, and uh, the, the cost that it, that it takes on people to do as well. So yeah, those were two honorable mentions for me. So two excellent honorable mentions. And I actually, uh, kind of speaking of uh fame and um and kind of uh, going that route i have an honorable mention here that i feel like is similar in the vein it's actually early uh, in the 50s it's 1950 uh this is definitely one of the biggest films 
uh, from this decade. It's definitely one of the, the classic films of it. And I'm talking about Sunset Boulevard yeah. right here. And, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, recognition and uh, obviously this is a film about a uh, has been right uh, in Hollywood and uh, kind of uh, somebody who uh, latches on to this personality um, that used to be a lot bigger and kind of in this toxic relationship uh, really kind of comes to understand like what the city of Hollywood and, and what the, what honestly just being uh, bigger than big, bigger than life or maybe being in the spotlight for too long, what, what what's going to happen if you do that um, or what it costs to get there uh, and stay there. And seeing that um, kind of just um, with uh, Gloria Swanson's character, obviously uh, William Holden's brilliant in this as well. Um, yeah, this is just one of those classic films that I, everyone needs to watch, especially if you're a fan of cinema. Um, and it kind of goes, uh, I haven't seen A Face in the Crowd, but if you're thinking of something like Ace in the Hole um, or um, something even more contemporary like Nightcrawler, like mm -hmm. seeing things like that um, and seeing like how far somebody will go to acquire this, um, you know, spotlight, this stardom that they want. Um, and really just looking at the, the human uh, element of that and like seeing how far we can be pushed uh, mm -hmm. into that. And it might be maddening. It might, these, these aren't all fun films to watch, um, but uh, there's lessons to be learned, I think, from, from these films. So Yeah. And Billy Wilder being Billy Wilder it was quite successful off the back of it too as well, I think it's first. <laughs> I know. <laughs> made, right. a lot, made, a, made, a, made a lot of films. Uh, my next pick is actually an uh, same era, same actresses, etc. And it's one, like, I don't think anybody will say this is one of the greatest films of the 50s, but this is one of the most interesting uh, films of the 50s for many reasons. And interesting enough that uh, your last Daniel, who did uh, the 40s episode, he did a um, an episode of Cobbs about it. And that is the gothic drama, uh, Suddenly Last Summer. Oh, yes, with, I've, been, uh, I've been wanting to get that indicator title. Yes, but Elizabeth Taylor, Catherine Hepburn, Montgomery Clift, directed by Joseph L. Mankiewicz, and a Tennessee Williams play. It is like this kind of all-star should have been one of the greatest films of all time, given the cast and all that kind of stuff that went on. Basically tells the story of Elizabeth Taylor, who goes on a holiday to Europe uh, with her cousin, and then comes back traumatized, basically. And so much so that they think she's mentally unstable. She's that woman who has lost the run of herself, and they try and get her lobotomized. Uh, and Montgomery Clift is her physician and he gets her transferred to a mental institution to look after her, etc. And, you know, the film itself, I think, is very good. I think it's very watchable. It's not a classic by any stretch of the imagination, but the story of this film in the background is way more fascinating given that, you know, Montgomery Clift probably wasn't fit to play the party, just had a he car crash recently. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor fought for him to get the part because she wanted to give him the chance he wasn't fit for it. So they had to stop it. And apparently Joe, Joe Mal Mankiewicz was very cruel to him the whole way through. So cruel, in fact, that Catherine Hepburn, when they were finished, asked if that was her last scene to record. And she hit uh, Mankiewicz across the face and uh, stormed off the set. Yep. <laughs> What I like, heard. Nobody wants to see that film. <laughs> see what that looks like on screen. I don't. I don't know. I just think it's utterly fascinating. Like I say, Elizabeth Taylor was was about as a big a part as there was at the time in cinema. Uh, I think she's excellent in, in the movie as well. But um, yeah, yeah, really great film. That's an excellent pick. And speaking of Elizabeth Taylor, I know this is a side note, but I just watched Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf for the first time. Mm. Whew. <laughs> uh, but anyway. Um, uh, so let's go uh, a little bit back to Billy Wilder and more jovial, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, this is going to be pretty obvious for a lot of people. Um, this is absolutely one of my favorite uh, fun films of all time. And it's it's one that has uh, iconic performances, iconic one-liners. Uh, it's just in, you know, it's just uh, something I've talked about. And I just actually just recently talked about this with my other buddy, Chris, um, when I recommended Criterions. But I mm -hmm. wanted to bring it up again because it's that good. Uh, and I'm talking about Some Like It Hot right here from 1959, um, you know, with Marilyn Monroe, uh, we have uh, Jack Lemmon and uh, obviously we got uh, Tony Curtis. Uh, and uh, this is just, it's, it's, it's ahead of its time, which I know is something that probably is, that, that phrase is probably used quite a bit, but it really, it really, this for this film, it really is. Um, and, uh, you know, this is 1959. So you have to think about America in the context uh, 
for especially something like this where it's like you know it's cross-dressing two men jazz singers who are escaping the mob uh alongside marilyn monroe and it really just honestly it gets all the way up to the end that final line really says it all and just like pushing it in your face and being like it's like you know what you're gonna be whoever you want to be and uh you know you gotta you love yourself and i think that's i that's such a great message and it's such a fun time to get there too um and a lot of zaniness ensues but I, i'm sure a lot of people have seen this film um if you haven't you you really need to because it's it's incredible and I'm so I'm so happy that I have this 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 movie on, on Criterion right here. Yeah, I, I often think about some like it hot. If it wasn't for some like it hot, I don't think we would have the impact of Marilyn Monroe. It's quite as as in her face, aside from the obviously the Andy Warhol, Andy Warhol artwork, but that would have been the other last legacy. And if it wasn't for some like it hot, I don't think people would understand quite how her popularity was or with the reason for it is, is right. maybe a better way to put it. You know, it's very much a testament to her. Yeah, and I mean, she's just she's just uh, really great in it. Obviously, this is kind of one of her staple films, right? Yeah. And so this is definitely one of those films that you would get that bubbly side of her, and maybe maybe not so much like you know if you look back a little bit, you know, in the past, like don't uh, don't bother to knock, for instance, is mm -hmm. something that I, I I really like from from her and her performance in that film, um, which seems a little obviously different. She's got a lot more layers to her her than obviously what um, she would be known for um but yeah some like it hot i mean even though it's kind of what put marilyn monroe kind of in the cultural zeitgeist i feel like um you know that film is really really important it's kind of crazy like like i was saying uh that it came out in in that that, that period and didn't didn't change uh the the culture as much as maybe well i guess in the 60s it would things would change quite a bit obviously. So it's a little bit, it's, oh, it's right there at the, at the cusp of, of change. Yeah. I think we said this before again, before we start recording that the fifties cinema was like a precursor for what was to come. It was nearly setting everything up. That was what was to come uh, in the decade that followed it, you know, in terms of both cinema and also just in general acceptance and culture and all those things that were coming. So yeah, as often happens, popular culture can be just a singular film or a singular act can be just the, the touchstone or the, paper that can whatever that phrase is uh, right, so, whatever that <laughs> can, phrase just is set uh, things off, audience yeah. tell us what it is down in the, the uh, that, yeah that, that, that's a good one indeed yeah. yeah so what about your next pick my next pick so i have of two european cinema here i've got an honorable mention because we haven't mentioned fellini yet no one's mentioned uh, fellini. and i'm gonna pick one of my favorite films from fellini and it is la strada uh, which is the story of, of this lovely young lady who happens to be Federico Fellini's wife, um, who is basically bought off her family uh, to go be a helper to Anthony Quinn in uh, the Great Sampano in, uh, in the circus, the traveling circus. So he's a strong man that goes round and she has a thing with Madame Deux from earlier on. He is uh, pretty horrible to her uh, the whole time. Uh, but at the same stage, that's kind of his way, if you know what I mean. That's the way that he expresses his masculinity and that he doesn't really consider those around him, maybe because he's a, a man who's lived by himself and in, in isolation all the time. But it's such a charming, charming movie as she tries to use her influence on his life for the better and, you know, he doesn't appreciate it. And, you know, the whole and then she meets up with... Uh, which would be a sort of character is the Joker in it, and he does have time for, her, but she's wedded to the idea of being with Zampano. Uh, again, very much like a road movie, the Strata, as they travel throughout the country, and as they travel throughout the country, their relationship changes and morphs over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, just a lovely, lovely movie that has some dark and sad parts <laughs> in it uh, that European cinema uh, would would often have, like I said, around that time. But my actual pick is another French film. I had to sneak another one in. Uh, <laughs> of course, but, uh, of course. A film that probably doesn't need me to recommend it, though, which is The Wages of Fear by Cuso. Oh, such a great uh, film. And The Wages of Fear. I was going to go for Diabolique as well, but The Wages of Fear, because it, uh, it actually obviously has the remake of uh, In Sorcerer from the 70s. Yes. Well, more, the some people have seen In Sorcerer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but Wages of Fear tells the story of two men trying to drive a truck full of flammable material from one place to another one to um well 
to say anything else maybe about it might 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 spoil an awful lot of the drama that happens but that's a very treacherous job yeah. and uh it's about their relationship with each other and helping each other get through to that stage it's just brilliant it i actually my i don't have it on on me right now because a, a friend has borrowed it for over a year i actually let him borrow that in sorcerer and i'm like damn it i need those back because <laughs> those are both yeah. incredible um incredible films um but yeah wages of fear i, I never i've only seen it once and i've mm-hmm. never forgot it it's one of those films you just yeah. don't forget you can't you can't like it's just um that's there's just... a tension that runs for such a long way through the film like they keep mm-hmm. it up here for such an extended period of time <laughs> it's really kind of intimidating but it, it, i think that's why you don't forget about it because mm-hmm. it, it has that 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 sense of you know you worry Urgency. for these characters a lot yeah yeah, yeah indeed there's real stakes well, those are good, both good road movies, actually. It's kind of mm. weird because my next pick will be a road movie that I know we talked a little bit about earlier, but it's actually uh, another European cinema, uh, but they were, this time we're going to Sweden. Uh, we're looking over there in that corner. Right there. Mm. But I'm talking about Wild Strawberries by Igmar Bergman from 1957. Now, I've talked about this movie a lot. Uh, I, actually, Chris and I, this is our favorite favorite film. Yeah, yeah it's definitely my favorite Bergman. Without doubt. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's, it's such an incredible film about uh victor throats i can never say his name right <laughs> victor how do you, do you say his last name strustrom is it is Fulstrom? that what it's i don't know i don't know Fulstrom. um anyway i'm sure Schubert, whatever i'm sure, I'm sure our friends I don't know. I'm, gonna... I'm sure our swedish uh friends will probably uh, you know let us let us know in the comment section down below um um but yeah um isaac isaac right here uh, Professor Isaac. Uh, he's just such an incredible, incredible. Um, well, he's not incredible. That's the thing. I don't know why I just I led with that. He is an old man. He's a grumpy old man who pretty much put his career first and his family second. Um, and his accolades are like really important to him. But he really never fully understood why his son and uh, his family is really just kind of put a, a distance between him. So this road movie is about him kind of uh, you know, traversing with it, within himself, reflecting even with a lot of uh, visual motifs. So you're you're going to go into some fantasy with this film uh, a little bit, which is actually a nice nod to the Phantom Carriage, which is you know mm-hmm. one of Victor's films um, that he directed uh, from early Swedish cinema. Um, but uh, what's really really incredible about this movie is he's reflecting all these these things that that have happened in the past, but also uh, built bonding and making a relationship with his daughter-in-law. I believe, Mm -hmm. um, and really understanding, uh, you know, kind of like the real crux of like why uh, his his family um, and him don't really get along. But he's also like picking up hitchhikers, and these hitchhikers are really just like you know, uh, really putting injecting youth into him, and really like kind of reminding him of what he what he used to be, what he what he uh, he missed out on, Um, and he even sees. Uh, hitchhikers that have uh, maybe some negative tendencies that you know remind him uh, some things that he may have done and it's just like I, I don't know it's just one of those films like it's really fun to watch but it's also uh, got a really good balance of you know it's something to, that is is heavy and it's, mm-hmm. it's heavy to, to kind of take in but it is really just it's fun um, it, it's it's a weird it's hard to explain how like that balance but it, it's really well done here yeah, it's, it's like a lot of Bergman movies for me, which are that they're very heavy in, in ideas and, and thoughts they go, but there's always enough room for you to think while you're watching it, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So as, as he's doing the bits where he's reflecting back and he's obviously acting as and reflecting what the thought is, you're doing the same with the introspection of yourself. You're doing alongside the character. And I think that's one of the reasons that it works so, so well uh, is that you really feel it. And it, it's funny, as you were saying that, it's basically a nice sister or companion to... Ikaru, because it's that kind of thing. This is a man that worked his life, worked his life. Yeah, and then an event happens and they reflect back on actually what living is and what and what they missed out on or what they should have been doing or, or things like that, you know? So that's pretty, pretty cool. Very yeah, cool. it's, it's, uh, I mean, it, there's a reason why it's both of our favorites. I, I would, yeah, I would yeah. highly recommend that one if anyone hasn't seen that one. It's one of the first Bergman films that I watched. I think the first film that I watched was another one from 57, which I'm sure people uh, are like, well, why aren't you talking about Seventh Seal? So, um, but that's also an incredible film uh, from that period. Uh, but Bergman, yeah, he was definitely starting up uh, a little bit more in the 50s and really kind of getting that groundwork for a lot of those comedy slash philosophical 
uh, themed tinged films that he would he, he would start making and then they would kind of transform and change up a little bit in the mm-hmm. 60s which uh, rightfully so and um, and you know it's it's a good transformation uh, that we can talk about later next decade so indeed uh, I think I think Wild Strawberries is a really good film for people to start watching Bergman on because like you said oh, it's yeah. kind of fun it is fun it is easy to watch while just making you think which I think is a pretty good precursor for for what the rest of his uh, his cinema would be you know if you get your your teeth into it yeah uh, I have I have two big trilogies left okay, okay you want to do so one I'll trilogy go- now yeah, I'll do one trilogy now. So uh, one, and again, this is a bit of a stupid one because who the hell needs me to, to recommend the Apu trilogy, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> but there there are a set of three films that are just... There, there's love and adoration for these films for good reason. Uh, not only do you, do you grow up with this young boy um, from his very early beginnings living in the country and then through him living in the, in the, uh, the city, but you get to see all the stages of, of his life and the people that are along his life with his sister, Durga, his mom, his dad, who's not there, then he is there, etc. And you really get a strong sense of, I think, that period in time. You know, the very deprivation and poor way that that uh, that he grew up, you know, or that they grew up as a family and what they had and what they didn't have or and how reliant they were on other people and why they would want to change and and kind of the options that were open up to Apu himself. Everybody says Panther and Panchali is um is their favorite. I actually really like the last one, a person sir, because I get to see I get to see him make his own decisions. Not ones that are just by other people or the right his, his circumstances. There were things that happened to him and of course things happen in, in that well in each of the movies that the same which goes it finds your heart and then it pulls it out through your throat it's absolutely uh broke me that and the last an awful minutes lot of, of sadness film. yeah last a lot 30. of sadness happens in that, in that film the last one broke me i just I yeah. couldn't cope i was just uh, i was like honestly this is just this is just too much but somehow all fits together as being very fitting of somebody's life because there are there is happiness there is sadness and when you weigh it all up at the end of it, you know, there's this balance that comes out at the end of it. And for who was a novice film, filmmaker at the time, it's just kind of unbelievable that these films were made around that period by a novice filmmaker with such skill and craft and that have stood the test of time to the po- point that they're just lauded so much now and rightly so. Right. Yeah. Also, it's because of, of uh, the country, is at least with... Um coming from our western perspective right um kind of seeing we don't really know much about the films from that 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 time period and honestly there aren't very many films at least that we know about or have access to uh, because obviously you know when we think of uh, that that culture in the current context uh you know we we think like bollywood films and we think of uh you know different uh different tales of that from like a you know western perspective something along the lines of um why can't I think of that Danny Boyle film uh, that is Slumdog Millionaire? Slumdog oh. Millionaire, or something like in the the yeah. you know the cultural context, it's like really big film. Um, but yeah, we it's one of those uh, like like you were saying, it's one of those films that because it has that neo realistic thing, which is why I, uh, a lot of those themes, which I have, may have a feeling what your other trilogy is. Um, um, but anyway, um, if. Uh, you know, you think about those those contexts going on in this time, like what we were kind of mentioning a little bit earlier, where this is the this is the the decade that you would have that transition <clears throat> from a lot of the very safe narrative kind of films, where it has like a tight uh, script, uh, has like you know a plot, and it has things going on for it, uh, and then you get into a lot of those that experimentation, that avant garde films uh, that you would see later on maybe more so in world cinema i suppose um and some in america as well um uh, maybe more in the 70s a little bit more uh in america where in the 60s uh we were starting to like notice some of that but anyway we'll talk about that later but uh yeah great great choices and yeah you're gonna feel a lot when you watch those movies yeah 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 i'd like to say that the, the the author in 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 that put in uh sorry Sajidit ray um he has stylistic things that were apparent in all of those 
those films that are that are common threads through that kind of that sense of film appreciation you were looking out for them in subsequent movies of his and that would be like the cornerstone of a lot of auteur cinema is like this this director has this style has mm-hmm. these things that he likes to do and once you see it for one filmmaker other filmmakers are trying to incorporate into theirs and and, and it follows on through and, and you get an appreciation for the way that films are made rather than just what the story was or, right. or yeah, et cetera, all those things that went along with it, you know? Yeah, and somebody that I'm thinking of off the top of my head that has like a, a good Sajit Ray, like understanding is like, yeah. you know, Abbas Kuristami, of course. The Coker Trilogy. Yeah, and the Coker Trilogy is a, a good example of thinking of auteur uh, and thinking of how how do you express yourself through the medium right and, and, and really importantly for both of those people to express or tell the stories of where you live or where you're from or where you grew up in a way that translates to the rest of the world it's like entertaining but also gives you a very clear window into what culture was there around that time or what it was like to grow up in certain right. ways around that time that we wouldn't have any experience of otherwise like other, otherwise it would just be you know news reports which only came many many years later mm-hmm. yeah it's uh yeah, these these are uh, all tough watches. So, but if you have the task uh, and you're definitely curious, you have uh, that mind to to go into those films, and I think think you're going to be richly rewarded if you're if you're patient and you uh, you know take your time with those um, mm-hmm. because it really does uh, sink in quite a bit. So, um, last serious film for me before we get to okay. your last trilogy. Um, I I just did a bender on this man, uh, this director. Um, so I. I I've, and I've talked about it quite a bit too, but I, I did want to mention that for the 50s because it was a, mm-hmm. another very uh, highly uh, social uh, film at the time uh, when it came out. But from 1957, one of the best years of films, um, 12 Angry Men right here uh, by Sidney Lumet. And uh, yeah, this is just uh, an incredible courtroom procedural drama with Henry Fonda as our, our main character. Uh, who is like, no, I don't, I, I'm, you know, I think he's, I think he's innocent. Uh, and kind of just makes everyone kind of question throughout this really, really hot uh, summer day, um, really start to unwind. And it's just, it's all in the script. It's all in the, the acting and uh, in this really tight and confined space. And it's, and also it's incredible. This is the first City Lamet film uh, that he directed. And obviously he made, if you've seen my City Lamet. Uh, journey that I just recently had. He he never stopped making good films, um, yeah. and so um, it's just it's just wonderful to uh, watch something like this because this is along I guess the same lines of something like To Kill a Mockingbird or um, to think about um, let's see Inherit the Wind for instance or mm-hmm. Judgment at Nuremberg. A lot of these procedural yeah. dramas that are really good for the time period and actually kind of just obviously Hollywoodized for sure. Um, but certainly see, at least in the American context, like kind of what's going on in the culture and uh, some social commentary alongside um, some terrific performances and really excellent scripts. So I think this is a good transition away from like a lot of those in the, in the 40s, uh, where you'd see a lot of like noirs and, um, you know, uh, I guess some comedies and, and talkies and, and things like that. Uh, I think where, where they started getting a little bit more grand, but also like uh, with some of the more epic films that we would see mm-hmm. in this time period, which we'll talk about maybe in a little bit. Um, but I think the script in this, um, is, that's the next transition, I think, uh, for for the 50s as they started going into films like this that would kind of, um, you know, just leave people like like thinking about like like what they're watching as they're watching it. So. Yeah, the interesting thing, because you mentioned a lot of the other contemporary films around that time, like Inherit and the and Judgment in Nuremberg, etc how different Lumet's approach was to 12 Angry Men compared to those because Inherent the Wind and Judgment Nuremberg are kind of made very similarly you know they're very you know very courtroom based whereas what the drama had whereas obviously 12 Angry Men the drama is actually Mm -hmm. behind uh, the courtroom and what goes Mm -hmm. on and the fact that the the constricted space there the very claustrophobic nature of it and the way he directed it yeah it's just the space more confined genius genius filmmaking and, and and so clever and again for all of the you think like a james bond film will scout the world for locations to create drama just bring the walls in a little bit just bring, <laughs> yeah. you know the, you bring know, the walls uh, in angle the camera a little indeed uh, and yeah. how you can create jam- drama without you know necessarily going all over the world and changing the viewpoint 
a lot, you know, just brilliant, brilliant filmmaking. Yeah. What about your last trilogy? So my last trilogy. Well, it's a bit of a cheat because one of these films didn't come out in the 50s. Sure. Yeah, 61, but is, I think, if anybody says this is the best film ever made, I think it's a very solid answer. Uh, the Human Condition, Masako ah, Kobayashi's. Yes. Uh, and it's just that. recently come out in Criterion Land as well. Mm-hmm. Is a film that a lot of people say is very intimidating because of its length. It's either three three hour movies, six one and a half hour movies. It's been chopped up a lot to make it more presentable. Uh, and there's no doubt that is intimidating for people to go. But I think once you get past the first three hours or the first four hours, the rest of it just melts away. You're so invested. Have you seen it? No, I, I I've been waiting for it um, because I, I I've only seen. Uh, I, I talked about Kobayashi not that long ago, mm-hmm. um, but um, I, I've been waiting for that release because I remember it was announced that it was uh, coming out back uh, back on Criterion because it was That's released right. on right, DVD so from them, but now it's on Blu-ray. So, yeah, so it basically tells the story of, of of the war and how one man gets involved in the war because everybody was being enlisted or whatever in Japan around that time and how he starts off with the idea that he's going to make a positive contribution to the war. He's, he's going to be a, you know, use his ideals and his uh, thoughts to be positive. So he's put in charge of a prisoner of war camp, um, Kaji. And then the film, over the next kind of eight hours, tells about how his decisions and how his principles actually play it out, you know, for intents and purposes. What resistance did he get? Was he able to achieve anything? You know, if he did achieve anything, did it have any cost to him? It is honestly one of the most mind-blowing things that I have ever seen. It's one of, for as long as it is, and for as tough as it should be to watch, given the subject content, it is spellbinding because you cannot help but feel for this man, Kaji, that is that is in front of you, that's trying to do this. And when you consider that Nakadai's first acting performance was this, it's just... It's incredible. I, I, I just there's just no other way to put the fact. There's, I would often say there's life before you've seen human condition and life after you've seen human ah. condition for a lot of people, right? Because it'll change your view on what is possible in cinema. You know, again, lots of different locations used, but it's very much a story about a, a man and about a person, and you kind of follow him rather than where he goes. You know, he. Is he the same man as he goes from place to place to place? It is just Kobayashi as a filmmaker who didn't make that many good movies has probably the greatest hit rate for making phenomenal films out of any filmmaker that's ever lived. Uh, but I suppose if, if some of the movies that you make are nine hours long in total, then it might take its toll on you a little bit. But uh, yeah, Human Condition, if you haven't seen it, I, again, I get it's intimidating. It was intimidating for me. I started off with, uh, I'd rented it first of all. And so got one disc at a time, which maybe helped. But as soon as it finished the first one, it's kind of like, I watched a bit of the second one. And then once once I watched the second one, I had to watch the third one. And it, was, of course. It, was, it was very much, it was just, I just had to see how that, how that ended up. And uh, yeah, phenomenal film. The only sadness I have to say is that both Criterion version and this one, there's, not really an addition that does a nine hour film justice. There's a get a couple of interviews, there's a bit of selected scene commentary, there's that kind of stuff. This this is a film that needs explored and with nearly another 40 hours of of extras in it and the themes and the things that are there. And that's what I wanted at the end of it. And there just doesn't seem to be one of those additions that exists yet. So Maybe one maybe day. I, maybe maybe we'll just have to do it, Nathan, or something. You know, if you yeah, well, <laughs> that's an undertaking, right? <laughs> maybe indeed, we're indeed. That. So yeah, we'll just that. I, I just urge anybody to watch the first part, even the first hour and a half, uh, and treat it as one movie out of six. Uh, lots of people watch the Marvel Cin- Cinematic Universe back to back, so you know. <laughs> yeah, might as well go go with the Human Condition indeed, uh, trilogy indeed. here because it's. Uh, I mean, you'll both have diff- You'll have uh, strong emotions either way, right? <laughs> Indeed. So, um, yeah, those are those are excellent. I can't. Uh, yeah, uh, spoiler. Those those are coming my way uh, right now. So I, I'm very excited about that. Um, and ever since I recently talked about Harakiri, 
Uh, I just, you know, and I've seen that many times and I love that film. Um, and, uh, yeah, I remember bringing that, that, that collection up and be like, I'm just waiting for it to come out that way I can watch it. Um, but I'll spend some, I'll, it looks like I'm going to spend some quality time with them. So. Yeah. You will. And, and like I say, he's got so many few films in general, but you don't want to rest them all. You know, you yeah. want to savor them and, and have their own place in time because you'll, you'll, mm-hmm. you'll thank yourself. Exactly. Pardon me. But speaking of uh, time, time savored and uh, more of uh, maybe the route of like thinking about like back when you were a child or uh, thinking about uh, things that like still to this day bring you happiness that you're like, wow, I remember watching this so long ago and it's still it's still as fascinating as it is now. I wanted to go the the fun claymation route um, uh, at the very end uh, here. Now, I, I will bring up. Um, Two films that I remember as uh, a kid growing up and really, really liking um, when I was a little bit younger, watching it with these with my with my dad. Uh, first of all, is a Ray Harryhausen film, Nathan, directed by Nathan Duran, right here, Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Um, great, great Harry ha- Ray Harryhausen uh, claymation work, and uh, you know this is it just opens up with a Cyclops scene on yeah. the beach, and it's just uh, it's just so iconic, and you know you're just like looking at this thing, and you're like that actually almost looks like it actually could exist, especially in the minds of, uh, you know, a kid growing up. It's like, like that actually looks really, really well done. And thinking, I, I have no patience whatsoever, by the way. Just wanted to let everyone know that. Uh, and so the people just thinking about the idea of making a stop motion picture or a claymation is just like, how do people have the time to move every little, you know, sinew or, or a little uh, slight motion uh, happening uh and you know just spending hours and hours and days just to set this up it's just yeah. it's mind-boggling to think about um you, you you love these films too right oh they're just uh, seven voices of sim but I, I was i was actually looking because i knew harry housing obviously had done a great volume of work around this time mm-hmm. but I, I, I had to go and look it up to see when it started and you know when i was thinking of my favorites i was thinking god no that's the 60s or you know otherwise and that extended quite a long way period up in the 70s etc oh, yeah. but yeah you're exactly right back when you think when i think back in the 80s where we were still using models at that stage you know the cgi wasn't really a thing so the the claymation stuff that high housing was doing was every bit as good as and in many cases better than the model work that was being done in, in modern days in the 80s which i think was which is why it captivated us so much as it did in those days and it's it's the imagination that, that's very much present on the screen that you can see like the the, the swords and the arms and the mm-hmm. oh just like of the 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 shiva right for for instance yeah, the, yeah. seeing those that battle uh it's just yeah it's just something that like it still brings me a lot of joy to watch those yeah. things and i if i ever have children like i'm gonna show them this and be like this is like this is something that like you can enjoy and like just you know uh, just kind of be whisked away by the magic of the movies, right? Yeah, so. and and I think there's definitely a thing about being a young boy and that, that thing of adventure. Like you just right. wanted to be on an adventure, and the Honey House movies were just basically adventure movies, not the type of which we see very much anymore. You know, mm-hmm. the, that kind of you know take you off to a far off land, the magical land. For me, it was the only film that did that, and my t- when I was young, modern cinema was like the never ending story or something right was doing mm-hmm. that or the goonies those were those kind of movies where you were taken and transported where there was riddles to solve or there was you know the, the kind of stuff stuff that the young boys kind of was their food and drink you know mm-hmm. carry over to lord of the rings and oh yeah exactly uh, yeah, just, was, yeah, yeah get, fantastic get um but actually um this is a side note before i get to my last pick um but i did want to mention it because it's not really talked about much and i just this it's such an iconic movie in my in my head as a kid, um, mainly because of just the image of Gregory Peck, and I'm talking about a film that kind of uses some some special effects to some great work. But I'm talking about 1956's Moby Dick, right here um, with Orson Welles and Gregory Peck, and it's just it's one of those films that is never like anytime I think about um, Moby Dick or at least the, the concept of it. I have still haven't read it. It's still on my shelf and I'm going to one day and I know I'm going to learn a lot about whaling, uh, the whaling trade. Uh, <laughs> Cause that's, I know it's very dry and I know that. Um, but just that, you know, that opening line, call me Ishmael, uh, and just and thinking about, um, even like the, uh, Ron Howard film, uh, in the heart of the sea, which actually I think is fine. I like it. 
um, I just, I've always kind of, you know, going back to that adventurous, no, advent, eh, adventurous notion, um, maybe more maniacal with this character, mm-hmm. um, egotistical and um, uh, certainly somebody who's bad on his own demons, right? Um, but yeah, just that iconic image of Gregory Peck as Moby, as Mo, uh, as uh, Captain Ahab. Uh, you know, I, I was going to say, no, that, I was going to say, I haven't seen Moby Dick, but that's a surprise that Gregory Peck was Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> it is. He's the whale the whole time. Uh, but yeah, you just have that white patch that he has here and that, that harpoon that he, I just always see it um as captain ahab and i just think mm-hmm. it's just uh it's one of those films that still to this day obviously uh you know watching it now it's like oh yeah there's a lot more talking than what i remember <laughs> but you know uh still so much fun uh and i would recommend it this is i think this is an australian release that i have here um hollywood gold series i don't know if Excellent. there's a, yeah. a good release of it but um you see have you, you haven't seen this i haven't seen movie dick at all no not at all so that's uh one i can i can add to the uh to the find, hopefully, out of the channel, like in a, in a cartoon channel, one day as an adventure uh, programming. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, I think that would definitely make it uh, on that list. All right. So, talking about Harry House and my last film uh, maker, uh, that I'm sure people would be like, okay, this is the the person working on the on the other side of the world doing the same. Uh, well, th- similar work, not the same, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to talk about a film. Uh, one of his earlier films uh, from Carol Zeman right here. And I love uh, this box set right here. Um, the, the three uh, fantastic journeys of, from Carol Zeman. It's a really cool box set and it's really flimsy, unfortunately. Uh, so it's uh, unfortunately, that's a little bit of the case, but um, I'm talking particularly about journey to the beginning of time right here. Mm-hmm. Now there's that cool little mammoth that the, the, the four boys see. Awesome. But I remember when I was a kid, obviously I had seen uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, um, but actually, so, um, you know, this is a Czech film, right? And so this is a Czech filmmaker. And so obviously what I think about as a kid is like, how did you, like, did you watch this movie? There was an American edition of Journey to the Beginning of Time uh, that was put out in English version. It's also on this box set. Right. Um, and I remember because I was huge in Jurassic Park and huge into dinosaurs uh, when I was a child. And I remember watching this film and it's that iconic opening scene where it's this uh, black and white world uh, that these four boys live in. And they go into this, this, this cave and this tunnel and then they you know, go out on the other side. And I just show you the, wo- the woolly mammoth is actually one of the first parts of the, of the film is they're, they're just into this other, other world here. Uh, and just transport it into this thing. And it's just one of those adventure tales, um, you know, like that, like we just talked a little bit about with the, with the Seven Voyage of Sinbad. Um, but it really is just a self-discovery tale and also like almost like a science and history lesson uh, at the time for this particular film. Um, and it's just one of those things that's like, it's highly enjoyable because you're like, you're, you're alongside these boys on this journey, uh, you know, just learning about these different things and there's peril, there's danger, but you're learning about things too. And it's just always... Uh, lived in my mind uh, and the American and I've also seen obviously the Czech version since I've you know purchased this this amazing box set I highly recommend this box set uh, really great films in here too another 50s film the dimension for destruction and 1962 the fabulous Baron Munchausen which Terry Gilliam would really love uh, as yeah, well I, I only seen that last week actually the, before we'd even agreed to do I watched fabulous Baron Munchausen from from Zeman and uh, so much fun I, I, I mean I know this this probably goes without saying, but the talent of that man is just it's okay. it's there to see on screen very, very easily. Like for those films that were made 55, 57, and 62, something like that, that, yep. that were like something like that. He blends live action and an animation way better than people were able to do for maybe another 30 years. I know. And like well, on the 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 version of Baron Munchausen that I have, which is the second run one, there's a, there's a documentary basically, which is the life of, it's like an hour and it's, it's a very long documentary anyway. Uh, I don't know if it's on that release, but it, it basically talks about how he broke into the the industry and basically he was given a, a project that 
that uh, somebody just in one place, somebody stormed away from him and he had to finish it off and he basically animated his, his way on and then was nominated for an award, his very first film that he contributed on. And that was basically the start of his uh, his um, his career then because he just loved to animate. He just he spent all day and all night. His daughter was on basically talking about it, basically saying he just didn't go to bed. He just animated all night. And that's all that the man did. And he just had this deep love. And when you look at those films, I, it just... I, I cannot believe when they are made. They they just do not look of that time and that place. Oh no. It look so outside of well, also outside of our own world, but at yeah. the same time just so imaginative and, and almost it's almost like going into you know, Alice in Wonderland uh, in a sense, but at, That's the same, right. at the same time it's just it's so um transportive, uh and I guess and uh inventive because of the way he utilized the camera and like setting up these these set these these scenes with with these paper you know cutouts and uh stop motion and it's just everything is just like how did you how did how does one guy envision all this yeah i uh, just uh, i mean honestly mind-bogglingly creative like it just and I, I, i'm I, can't help but be happy when you see something like a kid is good to release as well. Like the, the packaging, as you say, as flimsy as it is, is just as inventive and as beautiful as as is on, on those films as well. And oh, beautiful. And then also just thinking about the filmmaker and his, his life, because obviously this is, uh, you know, the, the height of the Cold War. Like he lived through most of that and he was, uh, you know, not, I think he was near the end of his, he, he passed away before the Berlin Wall fell, I believe. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and never really saw the recognition out here in the West until more recently. But um, you know, it's it's interesting to kind of see where you know the the social and political climate that he lived in and what he was doing uh, for you know the Czech population and really trying to you know bring. He really he it seemed like he had a good understanding of like trying to bring happiness to everybody who mm -hmm. was watching the things he was watching and so oh, there's, there's definitely a real incredible. playful nature to his, his films there's that, that definitely comes comes through and uh yeah and, and i do think it's interesting when you you think about you know post-war a lot of eastern europe was was in tatters basically uh for a lot of that stage but the amount of ingenious filmmaking that went on in those places at that time there just seems to be a never-ending treasure trove of it you know that, that that keeps on getting released and shown and especially when you get the 60s uh, especially in Czechoslovakia was just well, some of the most inventive filmmaking that, the, that there was and obviously had to be inspired by the people that started it off like Zeman. yeah it's just uh you know uh going into this decade I always thought uh you know this is maybe one of those like we've we've mentioned multiple times is one of those transition decades but it really it, it really goes to show the the depth of the in the variety that we had uh, that we showcased that there's different mm -hmm. themes playing uh, you know alongside for things that would come a little bit down the road but some of these films is like I like these more maybe even so than some of the films that would come down the road that were inspired by them so honestly it's it's an incredible journey so yeah it is indeed yeah but uh, anyway uh, do you have any final thoughts on the fifties um. I I have to say, if, if I had been able to pick any decade, 50s would have been it for me, because for me, it has some of the most interesting, like we just said, the interesting films that were there, and we didn't even talk about it. a couple of other people, like Samuel Fuller didn't talk about, or Otto Preminger, for instance, right. but uh, we could have went on and on. I mean, I, yeah. I just think, I think we're getting into a period of cinema now between 50s and 60s, where it just gets more and more diverse as every decade gets on, and you can, there's deeper corners to probe in mm -hmm. uh, as you go forward, so it's very cool. Yeah exciting but also daunting yeah indeed so, um, i look forward but, uh, to the five hour version of the 2010s or the 2000s you know oh, that, that, that'll be good <laughs> yeah well well uh i'll definitely like like this where it's like i'm gonna have to like break it down into like themes <laughs> maybe <Yeah. laughs> might be a little bit easier to to tackle yeah. there um but anyway where can everyone find you chris yeah, you can find me on youtube is probably the easiest place to find me um my youtube channel is just my name Nothing fancy about it, but uh, you can catch me on there and you'll catch as, uh, as Nathan quite already said, I'm doing the French cinema season very, very slowly and then doing my watch list, kind of trying to do those every week and we'll see if we can pop some some videos out, but uh, yeah, you can catch me there. 
And I, I say uh, those are excellent films, uh, or uh, excellent uh, videos to watch uh, from Chris. And uh, they're um, like he, he's been savoring these French cinema uh, films. And I, I think he does a really well, uh, excellent job on his channel to talk, discussing these, these themes and, and these films uh, in a lot of different contexts. But I, I'd highly recommend it in the description down below. Check him out. Um, I just want to say thank you, Chris, for, for joining me on this 1950s venture. Yeah, it was very cool to catch up. It yeah, was, it was always good having a good chat with you, Nathan. I appreciate you asking me. And uh, yeah, if anyone who is watching this right now, if uh, there's anything that we missed, um, you know, or some of your favorite 50s films, tell us down in the comment section down below. We would love to hear from you. And, you know, we want to hear your thoughts on some of your favorite films from the 50s. Maybe there's some things that we haven't even seen before, or maybe they're on our list uh, that we're eventually going to get to, right? Um, but just want to say thank you so much for watching this video, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it, uh, and I hope you liked the video. I hope you can share it, uh, hit the notification bell, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. I'm not Jones and Ram.